Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Kim Shin Jo, a gentle pastor from South Korea, used to be a trained killer. In January of 1968, Joe and a team of assassins descended from North Korea, slipping through the woods in a daring attempt to kill the president of South Korea. The team of 31 commandos made it to within a few hundred meters of the president's residence before they were intercepted. A fierce battle ensued, killing 30 South Koreans. All of the North Korean soldiers were killed except one who escaped and Kim Shin Jo, who was captured. After months of interrogation and through a surprising friendship with a South Korean army general, Kim Shin Jo's hard heart started to soften. Later he would confess, I tried to kill the president. I was the enemy. But the South Korean people showed me sympathy and forgiveness. I was touched and moved. The South Korean government eventually released Kim Shin Jo. Over the next three decades, he worked for the military, became a citizen, and then married and raised a family. Finally, he became a church minister as Kim Shin Jo found new birth in God's grace through the power of Christ. And despite his betrayals and sins, an army officer accepted him, befriended him, and believed in him. At one time, he was the enemy of the South Korean people, but in the spirit of Jesus Christ, they surprised him with the startling gifts of belonging, forgiveness, and even citizenship. Likewise, the Apostle Paul was once the enemy of the followers of Christ. He had come to arrest, bind, and have believers in Jesus Christ put to death. But after his conversion on the road to Damascus, people like Ananias and other believers in Damascus showed Paul great grace and mercy as they befriended him welcomed him into the family of God, and even saved his life. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 16 read, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Following the conversion of Saul on the road leading into Damascus, in verse 10, the Lord appeared to a follower of Christ by the name of Ananias, who was a highly respected and faithful Jewish man. Acts 22, verse 12 describes Ananias as a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. The Lord gave Ananias directions to another man's house on the street called Straight in Damascus, where he would find Saul of Tarsus. Interestingly, Straight Street in Damascus still exists and is one of the main thoroughfares running three miles long east to west through the ancient city. The behold in the Lord's words for behold he prayeth is significant to show Ananias that Something has changed with Saul, and the Lord was calling attention to it. Humbly now he prays, and thus Ananias did not need to fear him. Right from his conversion, we find Saul praying. He was a man of prayer, as we clearly see in all his epistles. He truly lived his words to pray without ceasing. The Lord told Ananias about a vision given to Saul while he had been praying and fasting for three days that a man named Ananias would come and restore his sight. And there's a lot of grace in that. There's grace in how the Lord comforted Saul to show him 
His blindness was only temporary. When the Lord appeared to Ananias in a vision and said his name, Ananias responded, Here I am, Lord. And he sounded like Isaiah when Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne high and lifted up, and he told the Lord, Here am I, send me. Likewise, Ananias had placed himself at the Lord's disposal, ready to do what he asked. But after he heard what the Lord wanted him to do, it was, Whoa, wait a minute here. You can't blame his hesitancy, really. Saul had a terrifying reputation, and Ananias didn't want to get close to him. Word from Jerusalem had arrived before Saul, so those at Damascus knew he was coming and why. And Ananias tells the Lord about the harm he had done to the Lord's saints in Jerusalem and how he had been given authority to drag off to prison all that call on the Lord's name in Damascus. And he tells the Lord all of that as if the Lord didn't already know. But what was what's interesting to note here is that the Lord was patient with the fears of Ananias. And that's encouraging for each of us. The Lord again instructs him to go. He tells him, go that way. But then knowing of Ananias' need for more information, he revealed his purpose for Saul in order to bolster Ananias' courage. And speaking of his name, as Ananias spoke of the Lord's name, the Lord said, For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul would bear the Lord's name to three groups. First, before the Gentiles, the non-Jewish nations of the world. Because as Paul stated in 2 Timothy 1.11, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. The order of verse 15 is significant. Gentiles listed before the nation Israel is not the norm. And this demonstrated that something has changed in God's dealings with man as a new age and dispensation was dawning. Israel was before the Gentiles in God's past dealings. And Gentiles had to come through Israel to find salvation. Israel was supposed to be reached first so that she would be a light to the rest of the nations in the world. But God saved Paul and sent him to the Gentiles because according to his perfect plans and purposes, after the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7 and in the dispensation of grace that was dawning at that time, God was turning now to the Gentiles. Paul's second area of ministry was to kings. He would speak to those at the top and to minister to those who were in positions of authority and influence. Throughout the book of Acts, you find the record of his appearing before the governors Felix and Festus, King Agrippa, and later even the very emperor of the Roman Empire. Paul's third area of ministry was to the children of Israel. And there's another subtle reference here to Israel's fall in the fact that Paul would bear the Lord's name not to Israel as a nation, but to the children of Israel. Paul would minister and reach individuals from both the Jews and the Gentiles who would be made part of one body. And then the Lord revealed to Ananias how, how Saul's ministry and impact would be made through great suffering for Christ's sake. And this same man would later write to the Philippians and tell them from experience that for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Growing in God's Grace is a paperback, 96-page book written by Pastor John Fredrickson. The studies found in this book are intended to help any believer grow in their knowledge of key subjects in the Scripture. More importantly, we desire that each reader be assisted in their spiritual growth. 
considering how the Savior wants to transform their lives by their yielding to the will of God, as revealed in the Holy Bible. May we begin in earnest a lifelong journey of growing in God's grace and growing up unto Him in all things. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, Call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Acts 9, 17 to 18 reads, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Going from fearful confusion to a quiet resolve, a now emboldened Ananias obediently went to the name and address of the house where Saul was located on Straight Street. It's important to note that the Lord sent Ananias to Saul, not Peter, James, or John, or any of the twelve. The choice of the previously unknown Ananias for this task made it clear that Saul of Tarsus was not dependent upon the twelve, something Paul strongly pointed out in his epistles, especially Galatians, that his apostleship and message was separate from the twelve. Finding the house and being led in by Judas, Ananias entered, saw the still blind Saul who was praying, Ananias put his hands on him. And that touch communicated Christ's love from Ananias for a fellow believer. And then he communicated Christ's love by his greeting, and that's significant, Those, these words, Brother Saul. Saul was now part of the family of God. And as such, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Saul's former enemies, whom he persecuted, were now his friends and spiritual family. Ananias has been called one of the forgotten heroes of the faith. And one author said this about him. The great majority of believers are the Ananiases of the world, the errand runners, if you will, doing precisely what God has asked them to do. There are countless numbers of them serving Christ behind the scenes the world over. Most we will never meet, will never know by name. They are content to remain in the shadows. Nevertheless, they are giants of the faith because of their selfless, understated acts of obedience to God. Ananias then explained to Saul his double purpose for coming to him. First, it was to res restore his sight, and second, it was so that he would be filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit had already been active in Paul's life in convicting him and then regenerating him when he believed. The Spirit now would fill and indwell him, the first member of the body of Christ. And when the Spirit indwelt Paul, this is the first time that the Spirit indwelt someone outside the land of Israel. This took place in Syria. And again, this points to God's purpose for Paul in sending him to the nation. And it speaks to all those who would be saved and indwelt with the Holy Spirit outside of Israel. In verse 18, after Ananias explained why he was there, and Paul received the Spirit, immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight. Described as only Dr. Luke, the author of Acts, could diagnose it, scales fell from Saul's eyes. Something physical fell from the eyes of Paul that had kept him blind for three days. Then Saul went through the physical ceremony of being water baptized. So why was Paul baptized when he would later declare that there is only one baptism 
the glorious baptism of the Holy Spirit at salvation, which places us into Christ and into the body of Christ and identifies us with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. First, we need to note that Paul was already saved before being water baptized. Ananias called him brother before it. And Saul was saved by faith alone in Christ on the road to Damascus. We follow Paul's pattern of just believing on him, that is Christ, to life everlasting. The terms under which Paul was saved did not include water baptism. Saul's conversion was the first step in the direction toward the transition away from God's program with Israel as he was turning to the Gentiles. The salvation of the leader of the world's rebellion against Christ by grace and the call of a new apostle separate from the Twelve were the first departures from the prophetic program. But that program with Israel would be gradually displaced by God's program with the body of Christ. And the message of grace for the church would be gradually revealed to Paul over time. We also see how things have changed from the beginning of the age to now by how the Holy Spirit was imparted to Saul with the laying on of hands and how his sight was miraculously restored. But that's not how the Spirit works today and now in the age of grace. Likewise, here at the doorstep of the transition from law to grace, from Israel to the body of Christ, at the dawn of this dispensation, water baptism was still being carried out. But as the Lord would later reveal to Paul, water baptism would be superseded by a greater truth, the greatest truth that we are complete in Christ. And water baptism does not make a person any more complete in Christ than they are the moment one trusts Christ as their Savior. Acts 9, 19 to 25 reads, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. These verses show the 180 degree change in Saul after his conversion. Instead of arresting believers in the synagogue, Saul instead preached in those very synagogues of Damascus. And like a racehorse, Saul burst out of the gate fast in his ministry and he boldly preached Christ and that he is the Son of God. Saul's unexpected conduct understandably amazed and bewildered the Jews live, who lived in Damascus, who knew his past and the reason why he had come there in the first place. They could not comprehend the drastic change in him. But as his ministry in Damascus continued, Saul confounded which means he stirred up the Jews in the synagogues, as he skillfully proved that this Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah of Israel. The word proving in verse 22 in the original Greek means to knit together. Saul's messages were skillfully woven together from the Scriptures. And word by word, verse by verse, point by point, he knit the Scriptures together as he taught and presented an airtight case for the truth that Jesus of Nazareth is the very Christ or the Messiah. And as he brought this truth forward from the scriptures in the synagogues, the Spirit worked through his word, and it convicted its hearers. Instead of responding to the word and allowing their hearts to be open to the truth to believe, 
Many close their ears and harden their hearts in their unbelief. And thus the initial astonishment of the unbelieving Jews then turned to rage. Verse 23 says that after that many days were fulfilled, or as time went on, the Jews felt the situation became intolerable. According to Galatians 1, Paul ministered in Damascus for three years. And so the many days mentioned here equals those three years. And Paul's proclamation of the truth over that time infuriated the Jews who did not believe in Christ to the point that they took counsel and plotted against Saul's life. Their star persecutor had switched his allegiance, and now he was a liability to them and became the target of their deadly persecution. So the hunter becomes the hunted. The one who came to kill becomes the one they want to kill. Luke does not tell us how, but the plot to, to kill him was discovered by Saul ahead of time. To prevent his escape, the Jews watched the gates day and night to kill him. It's important to note in verse 24 there that they watched the gates, but they didn't watch the wall. Damascus was a walled city, and it was a high and a wide wall. The gates in the wall were the only conventional means of escape, and the Jews watched the gates because they didn't want Saul to just leave or escape the city. They wanted him to die. His preaching created such controversy that for those who did not believe and were enemies of the truth, the best method to them to end it all was to kill Paul. In 2 Corinthians 11, 32 to 33, Paul gives us more information about this thrilling account. In Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. The unbelieving Jews who hated Saul enlisted the aid of the Gentiles and stirred up the civil authorities, something they did at other times in the book of Acts, as you continue reading Acts. Eridus was the king of the Nabataeans, which was a region that included Arabia. He ruled from around 9 BC until 40 AD. The governor, mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11.32, was a ruler in Damascus placed there by King Eridus to govern that city. The local Jews plotted the attempt on his life, and the governor of Damascus supported, the, supported them in it. He cooperated with the Jews in their attempt to apprehend Paul. So this was a joint military and religious plot against God's servant. The governor guarded the city with a garrison of soldiers to prevent his escape. The Jews watched the gates and the, the soldiers were all over the city. And behind the scenes, this was all the work of Satan. The former persecutor had been delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Satan could not take away Paul's salvation, so he tried to silence his testimony. And then ironically, the ones whom Saul had come to Damascus to arrest, they save his life. The Jews hatched their plot, but the disciples and followers of Christ wove their own plot with a woven basket. People lived in the walls of ancient cities. In Scripture, we learn how Rahab the harlot lived in the wall of the city of Jericho. Likewise, Damascus had apartment houses in its wide high walls, and windows for those houses were on the outside of the wall. In the dead of night, Saul was taken by the followers of Christ into one of those houses in the city wall and put into a basket. The word that Luke uses for basket here in the original Greek is the same word used for the baskets of leftovers from the Lord multiplying the seven loaves and a few small fishes at the feeding of the 4,000. In the New King James Version, Mark 8.8 8 reads, So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. 
The word used by Luke to describe Paul's basket means that it was a large basket. Then in 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul described his escape from Damascus, he used a word that refers to a rope basket. A rope was wrapped and woven into a basket form and tied all together. And a large rope basket would have been strong enough to hold a full-sized man. Paul's basket escape reminds me of Moses and how he was delivered in a basket as well. Exodus 2, verse 3, And when she, Moses' mother that is, could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. The ark of bulrushes lime, lined with slime and pitch was just a waterproof basket. When Israel's male children were being slaughtered under the edict of the Pharaoh, Moses' life was spared by Pharaoh's daughter finding him in a, in a basket in the Nile River. And thus the one who the Lord revealed the law to was delivered from death in a basket. And here, the one who the Lord revealed grace to was also delivered in a basket. Since the city was filled with soldiers looking for Paul and the Jews were watching the gates, escaping down the wall was the only option. Under the cover of darkness, Paul was taken by the followers of Christ in Damascus to an apartment house in the wall of the city. In the house, a long rope was fastened to the basket, and then Paul got in it. The disciples then lifted him out of the window. And while Paul held on tight, I can imagine, with both hands, his friends lowered him away, quietly, carefully, and cautiously, slowly but surely, farther and farther and farther down until the basket struck the ground. Then the apostle of grace stepped out of the basket, gave a wave to his friends above, and all alone he went out into the darkness and escaped out of his enemy's hands. And after all this, I imagine that Saul was probably a basket case. Saul had quite the entrance and exit from Damascus. He entered the city blind and he left in a basket. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.